So for over a decade, I've been making a good portion of my income as a woodworker, making and selling the stuff I make out of wood. So I, I think I can call myself a professional woodworker, and I might not be the greatest, but, you know, we earn money on that one. And I'm kind of in a situation now that I'm about to admit something to you that's really embarrassing. But I think a lot of professionals, you know, just about in any career, probably have one project that they've been putting off for so long that it gets somewhat embarrassing. So you continue to put it off and it just gets worse and worse and worse. So don't judge me. For the past two years, this has been my office, my office desk, a plastic fold up table. There's no organization, there's no drawers. It's hard to keep clean because you have to take everything off to dust. So I just don't, I just piles everywhere. And what's even worse, the seven years before that one, it was a smaller plastic fold up workbench. This is an improvement. Even worse, the few years before that one, it was a kitchen table in an RV. Years before that, it was a fold out cart. Well, you see where the pattern's been. I don't think as a professional woodworker, I have ever had a decent work desk, a place I sometimes spend 16 hours at editing. <laughs> now the excuse I personally use to slack off on building myself something at least halfway workable is that I've always been kind of a bit transy, kind of in a transition. In fact, that's same situation right here. I'm not gonna be in that small apartment forever. So why spend the money, time, and effort to build something that will last a long time if I know that's not where it's going to be and it's going to have to move quite a bit? And, you know, a folding table just kept my computer up at eye level for me to type at. Not great, but that's what I've been telling myself all these years. And I'm sure there's a project out there that you have just an invalid excuse for not to do as I did. So I'm going to finally set aside just a little bit of time to build myself a working desk, something that will actually function, have some storage and organizational aspect to it. But here's the deal. It goes against all I am to just go buy something like an Ikea pre-assembled stuff. You know, you screw it all together like you college students do all the time. And I see them out by the dumpsters at the end of the semester because those kind of things just don't last that long. They get a few semesters out of them, maybe their college career, but it's not going to move very well and they're just going to fall apart. And I went online and I looked and even the cheap ones, you know, they're 300 bucks and plus or minus there. So... If I set myself a budget of maybe less than $500, my goal is I want to make something that's going to be sturdy, I'm going to be proud of, oh, last, but A, it's not going to cost me that much, less than $500. It's not going to take me much time because I have other stuff I need to be making that's going to earn me money, so that stuff I can sell. And I want it to last my lifetime. And that last one right there is a real kicker because I know I'm still transient. Whatever I build is going to have to be moved someplace else in a few years and probably move one more time in my lifetime to buy the last home. That's kind of the goal. But it might not work in its new location. But if I spend good money on good materials, maybe I can design something that I can disassemble and reuse the materials later on so that money doesn't go to waste. The materials will last my lifetime, if not necessarily this form. Hence, the first element of this overall table goal, I went out and bought this. A cheap mechanics tool cart. Something that already has drawers and cabinets and all that kind of stuff pre-built for me. And this right here ran me about $250. I retail about $290, but I found a coupon at one of these store discount stores that we all know about. And, uh, it got the discount. I do understand that the prices for this particular model have skyrocketed since COVID and they used to be a lot, lot cheaper, but $250 was about the cheapest ones I could find that had, you know, five nice, yeah, five nice drawers and was the size I want.
But this channel isn't about putting nuts and bolts together, so I'm going to do a quick montage of putting it together, and afterwards I'll tell you why I got this particular model. Uh, because, you know, the re my reasonings might not be the same as yours, and if you want to do something like this, there are a lot of options like this out there. Now this toolkit did come with a uh, set of casters, two that span and two that are fixed. And if you're using it as a toolbox, obviously that makes sense. But as a piece of furniture, I actually don't want it to kind of wiggle around or anything like that when I'm sitting down, pushing against it, drawing or anything like that. I want it to be a little bit more secure. So instead of putting these casters, I'm just gonna cut some blocks of wood to put down here. Plus the fact that, you know, a block of wood's only gonna come down about that far. So it'll lower it down a little bit, which will fit more with my plans. So that's up next is a little bit of woodworking, just cutting some blocks and using the existing screws that they had for this to install those. So I'm just going to use a little Mahoney's for the finish. It's a oil wax finish. I think it's walnut oil and beeswax. Don't really know what else they put in it, if anything at all. And as in the video you saw, these are just hard maple blocks. You know, I went a little bit fancy and put a bevel on it just because I thought it'd be a little bit more durable that way. I uh, use the same hardware I would have used to install the uh, wheels. The only difference was uh, I had to cut a little recess because they're designed for thin metal, not thick wood. And this is thick enough that, you know, you know, if something falls down underneath it, I can use a stick or something to scoop it out. But otherwise, it'll just give a nice place for all the dust bunnies to collect. And on the very bottom, I put a little leather washer. Uh, just uh, dampen it on the ground so it doesn't scratch the floor or stuff like that. I'm not really sure if you're supposed to put the uh, rough side up or down, but I figured the smooth side would stick better, and I used uh, hide glue, which is leather also. <laughs> so beyond that, let me get this on the ground, and we will talk about why I chose this particular model. 
But before we do that, how about a word from this video's sponsor? Hey, do you study woodworking? Do you get the philosophy of the craft? The mantra that shapes every decision you make in this century old arena of workmanship. It isn't measure once, cut twice. And it isn't woodworking minus patience equals firewood. Nor, if you don't have time to do it right the first time, you don't have time to fix it. Nor is it no safety, no injury. No safety, no injury. We here at Worth the Effort want to make sure that for your entire woodworking career, you never forget the overriding principle that guides every decision you make in how you design your craft, how you design the joinery, how you cut wood, how you work wood, how you manipulate round trees into square forms. And to do that one, we have created the final in the trilogy of Worth the Effort Coasters. It's always about the grain. And remember, only the original cow-made Worth the Effort coasters are guaranteed to protect your culinary investments when used properly in the workshop. Get yours today at the nearest computer keyboard or mouse. Link in the description at worththeeffort.com. So why this one over the other one? It came down to the fact that I want to use it as a desk and I, you know, I'm a YouTuber, so I have a lot of technology and stuff like that. So I want to be able to put electronics in here, have wires and cables and stuff coming into this area in addition to the spaces and stuff like that. You know, my printer and paper and stuff can go down below and then be able to close it whenever guests come over so my desk looks kind of nice. Then there's how it was actually built. Its frame is actually these angle irons right here. So there's space on the side. That's gonna allow me to actually drill a hole right here for the table support. So this becomes one leg and I only have to build another leg on the other side. And whatever table I can do can rest on what I install on this. So the really the only modification is I just gotta drill two holes on each of these legs for whatever support I'm going to be using. I like that. Plus the fact that one of the reasons why they did this was because as a mechanics toolbox, you need to store some long things like long screwdriver, or Tommy bars, that kind of stuff. So they have, they have these holes right here that go into that cavity, which is perfect for me running my electronic cables to my table, my, my workbench. I could just have long USB com cables coming in here, power setups in here to power all my uh, hard drives and stuff like that just to keep everything nice and organized. So it'll work perfectly for what I want to do. Plus the store that sells these has a lot of little things like this little magnetic hook that are color coordinated. Now, which is something I forgot to say that, you know, depending on what decor you wanna do, you have a pretty good selection of different colors to choose from with this particular model. I just thought white would be the most attractive for a future business set, set up because the table I'm designing, I could really see ending up into a little retail section of my shop uh, for a cashier or something like that to sit at in the future. Plus, some of the other accessories is they have these magnetic power strips that work perfectly with us. The only thing I'm gonna to have to do is at least one of these holes, I'm gonna to have to make a little bit larger, which is not hard to do, just a step bit will do it. Just big enough to get a plug through it so I can power my electronics in here. So to recap, the only modifications I'm gonna to have to do to this thing is to enlarge one hole to get a plug in here and drill a hole so I can put some bolts to this side. I can't see anything that's more DIY friendly. We're talking a drill and that's all you need to modify this. Now to attach the table, I'm gonna use total overkill, a piece of angle iron. Uh, I've been practicing, trying to learn metalworking and I go to the salvage yard and I bought a bunch of these a while back, uh, basically just paying by weight to pick up the whole stash. But a DIYer out there, like a lot of y'all, 
you know, you're not going to have the metalworking tools and stuff like that other than maybe a drill. Don't worry. You can actually buy a you know, decent sized angle iron, more than strong enough for what we're doing here from just about any of the big box stores. But I will tell you, they're going to charge you an arm and a leg. In fact, if you have a metal supply place, I bet you can go to them, tell them, hey, do you have some two inch angle iron? And they will sell you a 20 foot stick of that stuff for less than you would buy a two foot stick, which is, this is going to be about two feet uh, from the big box store. Now, the place I go to, they charge me basically $2 per, per cut. I'm willing to bet if you went to that place right there and said, hey, I will buy an entire stick. Will you put two cuts on it for two feet per one? And if, hey, if you can throw in those cuts, I'll give you a deal. You can keep the rest of the stick. That'll give you one to put on this and one to keep. And that way you won't have to store it and you'll probably spend less money than in the big box store and probably get something even a little bit better quality. But to modify this one, I basically just have to cut it to length put two holes on this side, two holes on that side, and maybe four holes staggered on top in order to screw up into whatever I'm using for the tabletop. If you're going to be building stuff for people to use, I cannot recommend this book more. It's Human Dimensions and Interior Space. They basically break down, you know, door sizes, hall sizes, desk sizes, chair sizes, angles, all that kind of stuff for just about anything we would build. It is one of my favorite resources. And according to this, most computer desks, they're about 29 to 30 inches. I'm a bit shorter at 5'8", so I'm gonna go for 29 inches. That's where I want my desk height to be. Now the top that I'm going to be using is one and five eighths inch thick. So that basically tells me how high I need to put this angle bracket to hit underneath that one and five eighths inch uh, top. So let's go get that done. So that's 29 inches and I need to have 27 and three eighths. So that'll be the top of the angle brackets. And that gives me my template for drilling the holes in this. Because, you know, hand drilling the holes in this thing, I wasn't that accurate. Now when doing this, I do suggest drill a hole on one side Make sure nothing moved on your lines and then stick one of the bolts in there to secure this side so it won't move as you shift to the other side. And then you can repeat all the other holes with both the clamps and a screw on both sides just for security. And there we go. Scary part's done. Now to do a little make pretty on this piece.
So after that primer, I put two coats of just uh, gloss white on this one. Uh, it's a close enough match, not perfect. This is a little bit more cream, but it'll be underneath, so it doesn't matter too much. But speaking of underneath, I need some way to attach this to the tabletop. So I need to go ahead and drill holes in this, but I don't want to drill holes in a straight line. Let me show you why. Right here is gonna be our attachment point. And if you're to draw, just do a straight line all the way across to attach all your screws up underneath, what happens is you now have a single point that is a leverage point, a fulcrum, so to speak. So it's not going to be as strong towards up and down and you can actually bend it down. What I would rather see happen is us to stagger screws diagonally wise. That way there is no real fulcrum point. Yes, we're only talking about an inch, but it makes a difference. Now the other problem is that, you know, if you have a tabletop, you don't want to put screws too close to that edge because it's almost guaranteed to crack. So we also don't want to put it all the way on the end. So if at all possible, you know, kind of stagger them out a little bit this way, which means that if you're not using angle iron, you're just getting something like a two by four that you dressed up and painted and bolted that to it, I would highly suggest you do something like this. This right here is your toolbox. You have your two by four and you're gonna put screws in right there. I would glue another two by four right here and put screws in right there in the center just to offset them. But that's just me. Just if you're using a wrench, be sure you don't go all the way down so you don't scratch your new paint. I kind of use a finger as kind of a shim to keep it slightly off the metal. So we have finished one leg of our desk. Fairly easy and just doing it with a screwdriver. So let's turn our attention to the top and the other leg because I really like the idea of doing a waterfall, a connected section. And I'm gonna tell you as we go along ways that you could do this as a DIYer using just the drill if you want to. But along the way, I'll add a little bit of my touch to it. So what I have here is, is an eight foot pre-built beach slab. In my town, we have a restore. It's run by Habitat for Humanity. They sell a lot of excess stuff like that. And one of their main products that they sell are these slabs. My dad bought one to do a workbench in the shop for, and he bought his out of pine. And they basically have like five or six different levels. You have a pine one, a beech one, then they have some walnut and then some other darker exotic woods. I'll put a picture here of those. They are fairly attractively priced. I believe in my market right now, the pine one was going for like $170. This beech one was going for $199, $200. But here's a kicker. At these retailer stores, uh, resale, Habitat for Humanity resale stores. On Tuesdays, they run a store-wide sale for people over 55. You can get 20% off. So this eight foot by over two foot slab cost me 160 bucks plus tax. So, so far in this project, because I used some scrap metal I had for that angle iron, I have what? 240, 250, 160 plus taxes, a little over 400 bucks in what's gonna be a nice table. Now the first thing I'm gonna do with this is to cut off one end and I'm gonna be using that as my uh, leg for the waterfall style table. And in all seriousness, if you're just a DIYer wanting to screw stuff together, 
you could pretty much be done at that point depending upon how long you make that leg. Me, I want a desk that's 29 inches, so I'm actually going to cut it at 29 inches even though I know I'm going to be putting leather underneath it, which makes it the thickness of that leather too high, but you'll see why later on. Anyways, go measure it out and cut it off. Now definitely measure twice on this one because if you screw this thing up, it is a $160 mistake. And whew, that was almost a mistake. Hey, even with power tools, you have to consider your kerf line. You want to always saw on the waist side of your line so you actually keep what you measured out. I almost did it backwards. And these track saws are really nice and really accurate. You don't really need them. You could do this with a hand saw. It's probably more than accurate enough. A circular saw with a very nice straight edge. I used to use a piece of aluminum angle iron for a straight edge. It worked great for years. But just being able to line that track saw up to the line kind of makes things nice. And while these clamps, these tracks are super grippy on bottom, many times I will just lay it down on the line and saw, run the saw on really critical part cuts. I, I, I'll use these uh, clamps to just kind of lock everything down so my stupidity isn't going to mess up anything too bad. What's done is done. Now, I want to keep this orientation. Granted, these are laminated up, so it won't make that big a difference, but it'd be kind of cool if I can get some kind of consistency as we go around it. That's what makes a waterfall. So I need this to be the outside of my table and this to be the top. So just a little blue tape for now will tell me what's what. So here's my new office desk, five plus feet of desk space, a cabinet at the end for the store stuff, and the leg over here. Now, I told y'all that if you're a DIYer and you didn't want to work on woodworking and joinery, I would show you how to complete this with just a drill. Here's how. Instead of cutting your leg to go the full width, because I'm doing joinery here, so it's going to show through, only cut your leg so that it goes to the underside of your table, okay? Now, I'll be the first to admit, I'm a bit prejudiced against, against pocket hole joinery. And a lot of y'all out there are saying, no, Sean, don't tell them to do pocket holes. But I am. I'm gonna tell you to use pocket holes to secure the leg to the underside of the table to prevent it from moving backward and forward. It's not, the screws are not going to be doing working this way. It's working its strength to prevent it from moving this way and that way. So if you use some pocket holes up underneath here, that's perfect. Now that is the reason why you have to come in a little bit. If you're to move the leg all the way to the edge of the table, you would have to have your pocket holes coming in this direction which means that the screws themselves would show to everybody outside the table. I see so many people online that will use a pocket hole with two boards butted edge to edge like that, and they come in from the inside. There's just no meat there for the screw to hold onto. It's going to break off. You've got to come in a little bit if you want to hide the screws. After that, I would suggest going to a hardware store or ordering online some iron uh, shelf brackets. Those 12 inch 90 degree shelf brackets that go in on the inside and then have that little 90 degree crossbar. In my example, I have five feet of tabletop. So if I were to sacrifice, you know, eight inches for where that crossbar is, that's gonna give this leg 
its strength this way. And that's a key factor because it's going to get bumped. Kids are going to run into it. Your dog's going to come around the corner and slam into your desk. There's so much leverage down here, pocket holes aren't going to do anything. In fact, if it was me doing it this technique, I would do it, bring the leg in even farther. I would bring it in almost a foot, which would still give me four feet for a chair to fit on. I would do those 12 inch angle brackets on the inside, and then I would search for some mantle brackets. You can probably find them in the same style. And they're only about six inches, so you would have them over here. And that will really prevent the torquing action coming here. And with those, if you buy iron ones, you know, you sand them, you prime them, you paint them, and it will look good. And the only tool you really need is a drill to screw it in. But I'm a woodworker. I've been doing this a while. So I'm going to do a finger joint. Now the finger joint is the most basic joint I, I teach here, uh, besides butt joints. In fact, I did a whole introductory to woodworking series where one of the first projects we did was building a Japanese toolbox where we used finger joints on all four corners. And I went into detail. It's a four part series building that two pot, toolbox but the first uh, part is just those corner joints. So if you really want to learn how to do this joint, I suggest checking that video out. Otherwise, I'm just gonna do a montage of making the finger joint here, and then I'll show you how to reinforce it, because a finger joint is basically a glue joint with lots of long grain to long grain joinery, but it doesn't have a lot of strength. But there's a way to reinforce it, and I'll discuss that later. Before I finish this side, 
I want to go ahead and tackle the side that's attaching to the tool chest because I'm going to be doing the same processes, so might as well do it over there. What I'm talking about is this recess. Now, I could just bump the table up right here and bolt it on, but remember me talking about having the bolt holes too close to the edge? It could cause it to split. Well, I might as well cut out this recess right here so that the table can slide all the way in here. That way, these are going to be a good four inches from the end, which means I did make one mistake, and I should not put this bolt hole here because it's going to be in the way. So I will either not put a bolt in there or I'll draw another one over here uh, to accommodate that. Either way, nobody will see that. But when you lay that out, you have a couple choices to make. Remember, this is going to be quite a bit bigger, wider than that tool chest is deep. So if you were to cut it out so that the tool chest was against the wall and centered everything right here, there's a chance that you couldn't bump the back of your table up against the wall and still open that lid in my particular toolbox. I think I would rather center the toolbox in here. That way I can bump the back of my table all the way against my wall to get a nice clean line if I want to put it against a wall. And then I will have space for not only the lid to open up, but for any cables to just kind of be loose back there. So if I'm ever next to a plug or something like that, there will be room in the back. Uh, now that would just mean I have a little decorative edge to put right here. So to do that one, all I'm going to do is do all my layouts of what I'm cutting off based off the center line instead of an edge. One nice thing about these though, is they don't have to be perfectly plumb cuts because I'm not mating them up to another piece of wood. It's just that little edge right there. So all I need to do is make sure my distances are all right. Don't really have to worry about plumb. Now, if you do go about the joinery route to attach your leg, well, when you're putting it together, don't slam it home. Kind of ease it in, and the woods will burnish where they're too tight. That way you can kind of remove it easily and just kind of scrape away just the burnish marks, and it will slowly loosen up until it fits. You actually just want it to slide in, because the glue will cause a little bit of swelling, so, you know, if it's too tight when it's dry, it, it won't go together when it's glue, when you got glue on it. So just kind of ease it down, slowly but surely. And then you can just use a chisel or something like that, and anywhere you've got burnish marks, just kind of slide it off, scrape it off, and it'll eventually fit perfectly. So there you go. Now, a finger joint is a semi-mechanical, semi-glue joint. Basically, you have two things that come together like this. Now, you can move in six different directions. You can go forward or backwards, left or right, or up and down. Now, with the finger joint, there's no way it's going to go forward or backwards because it's got the other boards in between them. And it's not going to go this direction because it's got that board in there. This board is not going to go this direction. But one board could lift up this way, one board could lift up that way. And that's where that glue adhesion comes into fact. But if we peg it, well, we take away any need for glue and the glue just becomes backup. So I'm going to be pegging these finger joints later on down the road. But next, we've got to take care of this torque aspect. 
because even pegged, that's not going to be strong this way. Now, once again, I could just buy my way to a solution very, very inexpensively so that this problem would solve with just a screw gun. Get another, once again, go ahead and get those angle brackets, come up here, that would take care of it. But let's go back to that, I'm a woodworker. Maybe there's a little bit more elegant solution. But whatever solution I use, I've got to put some kind of angle bracket right here. And I don't have the money to go buy more of this, you know, six quarter beach. Don't even know where to get it. I'm not gonna buy another 160 foot, $160 section, just get that triangle. So let's kind of figure out a way we could take it out of here and just have two legs. And maybe using our woodworking creativity, we could create a shape that would make this waterfall a little bit more elegant. Now, those of y'all that were paying attention might have noticed a recurring theme that I've set up at the very beginning. Basically, when I set the size of these finger joints, I'm going off of a two-thirds rule. I took the thickness of this board, I divided that in half using my uh, compass. And then I walked off three steps of that half, thus this became two, and those three steps became the width of my fingers. Three. So if I kind of keep that mathematical formula throughout this build, I'll have a recurring theme. Now, most people might not notice it, but it'll look right by that, by doing it that way. Now, me using themes like this, really it is just me compensating for not having any formal design skills. And what I've found is if you use math and you repeat those kind of things, it, it just kind of looks right. So with the idea of two thirds, I want my legs to be a two and the gap between them to be three. So right now, if, so if I have two, three, and two, that's seven. So I just need to divide 26 inches by seven and that will give me my X. So three and three quarters is close enough. So each one of my legs is going to come out to be seven and a half inches and the gap in between will be my three ratio. So right now the bases of the legs are going to be the same, but I would kind of like the front leg to be a little bit lighter looking and the back be a little bit heavier because it's going to be up against a wall. So how can I do that one? Well, once again, going back to two thirds. I've got the end of one leg here, the end of one leg here. We got three sections here. So I come out and I'm going to now draw a line right here. And I'm going to come up that line 3x. That puts me right at 11 and a quarter. And right at that spot, I'm going to drive me in a nail. And I can take something flexible and create whatever kind of curve I want to that spot. I'm trying to get this to line up pretty perpendicular so it starts out straight. And then I want you to notice I'm gonna carry over my line past that. And then do the same exact thing to the back half. There, I got a somewhat nice shape. So now we just use whatever tool you had to cut that shape out. I'm using a jigsaw. wood that I can use as my brace. Uh, I just need to square up this with one of the edges so I can put that in the corner. This will be the underside of the table and this will be for whatever goes against the leg itself. Now there's a lot of different ways you could attach this as a woodworker. If you have something like a domino, well you could use a floating tenon and just have tenons coming up into both pieces. Uh, you could even just uh, do uh, uh, screws, if you wanted to, just come in at different angles. Glue and screws would work. I'm going to do a sliding dovetail in that. I'm going to create a dovetail joint on top here that I'll slide in. And then I'm just going to trust the glue for a long grain to long grain adhesion because that's going to be a pretty 
that's a lot of glue surface, so I think it'll work. So next I just need to process this to put a dovetail on top and square up one edge. So if you can't tell, I'm playing a little bit. I did a little bit of shaping on the bandsaw. And, uh, you know, throughout this piece, I'm going to do a lot more carving and stuff like that. But this one, I, I have to kind of at least get the shaping done now before I put it into the table because I won't be able to do it afterwards. So just playing a little bit. So this is my spoke shave, and basically it allows me feather curves and stuff like that. And this is one I made a long time ago. I'll probably, I, I might already have a video out there, but if I don't, I'll show somebody how to do it someday. But what I do is I set up heavy on this side and light on that side. So if I want to rough off a lot of material quickly, I can basically just use, stay on one side of the blade and get a lot of work done. Then I can come over a little bit and take a finer shaving later on to get a smoother cut. But all this is is play. If you're new to woodworking and you want to try something like a sliding dovetail, I'm going to tell you just go for it. It really is if you can draw a line, well then you can saw a line. That's what we covered in our Start Woodworking series. So all I have to do is be able to draw this triangle right here on this board and I can figure out how to saw it. Now, this is the bottom side of the table, so this is actually the back side that I'm going to be putting against the wall, but maybe in the future might be out in the open if the table's in the middle of a room. Uh, I'll decorate the back later on. So, I don't want people to see this dovetail, so I can't put it on a finger. I have to put it on a recess because the other board will cover that up. So, I'm not going to be able to put it in the center of the table. It's going to be a little bit back. And all I need to do is find a pencil. Slide it in here. Now, I could do it this way, but I've already got that notch cut out right there, which is going to hide any kind of slop I have when I'm cutting out my mortise for this thing. Well, I could just drop that right there, and if I can draw it, I can saw it. So just take my pencil and trace that angle and the baseline. Anywhere there is lead, I need to leave. Now, some of y'all say, well, you weren't able to get to the other side. That's right. But I still had the off cut from that little notch right here. 
And I can use actually use that, line it up with the angle right there to get the other side. So I now have a baseline and two angles for me to saw. And since I still had the baseline for all these fingers, I can actually drop a chisel right in that line and square up a square with a pencil line and just extend it out. Just like that. Once again, use a chisel to establish your base with a pencil line and extend it down. Worst case scenario, if this is off a little bit, you can either glue in more shavings, use a thicker epoxy. There's always a solution, so you don't have to stress about it. And from there, to figure out how long it needs to be, and once again, if you can see a line, you can saw a line. Now, a lot of people kind of stress a bit on cutting advanced joinery like a sliding dovetail, and they'll take a lot, make a lot of jigs and stuff like that that they think is going to help them. Uh, stuff like creating, you know, a board the same angle right here so that they can rest their saw on it and get the angle perfectly. And honestly, I don't quite understand that one. People stress about the angle, but they cut 90 degrees all the time, and 90 degrees is an angle. This is just a slightly different angle. All you're doing is following the line. And they take a bunch of compensation stuff like that. But I'm telling you, just pick up the damn saw and saw to the line. And here's the thing, this might be advanced, but nobody will know it. If you do it right or successfully, it's totally blind. What that means is if you do it perfect, nobody's gonna know. If you do a crappy job and have to repair it a hundred times to get it to at least work, nobody's going to know. It is 100% totally blind. So after you glue it together, you can just tell them, I did it on the first try. Just pick up the saw. What I like to do is I will saw this angle right here to establish it, that creates the curve, and then just follow the line forward until I come to the end. Not a big deal. So here we go, use my fingernail, put it on the line, because I don't want to take the line, I want to leave the line, that's part of the wood that needs to stay. I've established my angle, and I'm just going to saw right down to the baseline. Not really worrying too much right now. I'm looking a little bit, but not too much because that's not the main concern at this moment. And then I will saw past my baseline. I don't really care because it's totally blind, remember? From here, I've now established the angle I'm sawing and that's not going to change. So now all I have to do is follow this line going down and just saw and guess what? If you get off your line, stop and figure out a way to reestablish the line. But once you get this far, you can pretty much have at it and it's gonna be right on all the way down. Okay, for some reason it's deviating a little bit right there. So I stop, I reset, I get back on the line, I start sawing. Got a little bit of pressure and create the curve. Notice I'm kind of raised up right here on this base a little bit to establish it. And then I can have at it again. And I'm back on the line. The whole trick is if you ever get off the line, is to just stop sawing and figure out how to get back on the line. It's not that big a deal. Just don't make it worse. Now here's something unique about stop dados. There's my stopping point right there. And one of the reasons why I cut this recess is because that's where that ends. So I have all this room underneath here to kind of mess it up a little bit. But you know, I still had to go down more and obviously the way a saw is designed, you know, you have to rotate around. So what happens is you might see me go a little bit past that line right now, but I end up stopping and I, I'm putting more pressure on the tip right here and I'm letting that first tooth right there kind of scrape away till I get to the depth I want. So here we go. 
Right now, I'm just at that surface point, and you can see, I'm just gonna go a little bit past it, and then I'm gonna start scraping. And it doesn't take long, and you're gonna have that depth you want. And once you get it a little ways, you can always chisel the last of it. So right now, I am that far deep into the stopped cut. To repeat, skill-wise, this is probably the most complicated thing in this entire project, which is why I think anybody can do it, even to this level, as a DIYer. So all I'm gonna do is use my fingernail to create a fence to get it started. I line the angle up. I'm just literally looking down the blade to line that angle up, and I start sawing. No big deal. Come down to my baseline. I'm a little bit off on this line up here right now, so what do I do? I stop and I fix the problem. I kind of bring it back up, and now I focus a little bit, just maybe an inch, and then follow the curve that's going down to reestablish it. No big deal. This is not something you need to stress about. It gets a little sticky, a little wax always helps out. Like going past my baseline here, go past my baseline there a little bit, and then just start scraping that nose to bring it down. Voila, won't let the chisel and router plane do the rest of it. Here's my termination line, so I'll come up a little bit, establish the end. V at the bottom. Go a little deeper. And I will basically do that until I reach the depth I want. From there, just chip out the rest of the waste. Though I do suggest you go bevel down so it ramps up and it doesn't ramp down into the wood. And my general rule is I will go about halfway down or a third. And you can just kind of see how it's gonna crack out. Right now it's cracking pretty straight so I can get pretty aggressive if I wanted to. Now you see why I did the stop at the end, because that's what stops the cracking. Now you might notice towards the end, obviously I didn't saw all the way down, but I now have this entire side to set up. But one thing about wood is it tends to crack at the point of least resistance. So I can actually shave down to my baseline on the middle, leaving just a little bit of wood on the sides. You don't want to use a chisel chopping this direction very hard because that has a tendency to wedge the wood apart and you can get a split. But if you're just shaving a little bit, once again, path of least resistance, there's not much resistance, so it'll split off on the angle we want. The trick is to just get as much out the middle at, at first. Now I can kind of take my big chisel, it'll line up with the angle and you just kind of wedge it down, chip it out. Wedge it down, chip it out. Easy peasy. <sighs> Next up I'm going to use my router plane to flatten out the bottom. And I, I'm actually going to make it a tad bit deeper than this right here. Now you might notice that 
I have a quarter inch blade in this one. I don't know if you can see that one. I kind of prefer the smaller blade over the, uh, the standard half inch one. I just find it easier to work. And there has been a bit of controversy in the woodworking community lately on this style of router. And basically they say that it moves while in use. Well, technically yes and no. If you basically use this little screw knob to push it down to its perfect level that you want it to, which for us is a little bit more than this. Well, what happens is there is a little bit of slop in that joint right there. I don't know, can you see that joint right there? See that? Well, you can move it about a quarter turn before it engages the little rod to move up and down. And there's always going to be slop in any kind of mechanics. Even a car engine has slop. It's measured in thousands of an inch, but there you go. Well, if you're pushing it down, the slop is on bottom. So as the blade is angled down and it wants to go through the wood, it wants to push itself down. So obviously the blade will move a little bit down. We're talking this much. Hear that? Just maybe a millimeter or two. So the key to doing this is always back it up to your desired position. That way there's no slop going down. I don't know why people make such a big deal about this stuff. It's, it's not that hard to understand. So to lock it, you have this little pin right here. You lock that down. And we're all set. Now I'm gonna lock this thing so I have basically one, two locks to control how this goes up and down. And how this tool works is kind of obvious. I will say this is one of the, few, the hand tools I kind of recommend for even power tool woodworkers because if you use a power router, for some reason they're never perfectly flat or this will get the bite base of your grooves or something like that perfectly flat. So this is a good complement to power tools. The only thing is I do say it's kind of prissy, so it's not gonna take huge shavings. So if your shavings get too big, just revert back to your chisel to get rid of most of the heavy waste and then come back to the router plane. So let's see how it's gonna fit. And I will tell you, I cheat a little bit. I'll generally take a few swipes of my block plane on these corners right here, just cause it makes it slide easier a lot of times, especially if you're not, you didn't get the corners of your groove as well. Okay, a little bit loose, but that is okay because I will simply use hide glue and maybe a little bit of sawdust mixed into it to lock it together. There's always a trick. The key thing is I need this to be in line with that line right there so I know that the leg will be plumb. So maybe a few hits. Eh, if that doesn't take care of it, I'll just take a little bit off of that right there. So with that, all the hard stuff is done and the rest is just play. A few roundovers, a little bit of carving, a little bit of shaping, and then we're gonna glue it all together. So here's a quick montage of all the superficial stuff I'm about to do.
With that, I now have my three pieces. My table, underside, little slot right here to slide that in, and the table leg. And the little carving aspect I did, I just kind of, I thinned out the top and added the texture, so it's kind of fun to feel as you sit down, your thumb wraps around it and stuff like that. And I did that on my math. Also on the leg, I did texturing on the front. I tapered the legs and texturing a little bit in the middle. I'll show you in better detail at the end. So to begin assembly, I'm first going to glue in this piece right here, the brace. Now the first step is gluing it all up. And if you remember, I made this bottom section a little bit deeper than the rest, and that's just to give it a good place for the excess glue to kind of con congeal. This bottom section isn't going to do that much as far as work holding because it's in grain to long grain. But if you're paranoid about it, just mix up a little five man epoxy, drop it in, in the beginning, and it'll kind of flow its way down and it'll fill up that gap. After that, we just got pounded in with the tight fit that we want. Just remember to get it going the right way because this is kind of hard to take up back off. And for those of y'all going, hey, wait a second, that didn't fit that tight earlier. 
Oh yeah, I fixed it. I'm simply gonna glue on some popsicle sticks right here, let them sit overnight. And then I can plane them or put them back through the table saw and just shim them down until I get a nice tight fit. Simple as that. Now my finishing regime for this project is basically an oil schlack and wax finish. I've done it many times in other projects, but here's a, a quick overview. For the underside of the table and the side leg, I start out by sanding up to about 220. And then I will use a half pound cut of shellac. And I'm actually using that as a sanding sealer. And what that'll do is it will raise the grain up and it will also kind of soak in a little bit underneath the grain. So as I sand off that raised grain to re-smooth it out, uh, it kind of hardens up so future grain won't raise up as much. At that point in time, uh, I will put on another half pound coat. Now, if you don't have shellac beads or something like that where you can mix up your own ratio, you can just buy seal coat. I wouldn't buy uh, bullseye seal coat. I wouldn't buy bullseye shellac because that's got some uh, wax in it. I like the de-wax stuff and that's the seal coat. And I believe that is a two pound cut, which means you just need to mix a one to four ratio with uh, denatured alcohol, or what I prefer is just buying some Everclear because the price isn't too much different and it doesn't have those drying agents in it that are kind of poisonous. So I'll do that again. I'll buff it with a brown paper bag to remove any kind of uh, grain that did rise up and kind of seal it back down. And then I put a little walnut oil on it. Uh, specifically, I use Mahoney's just because it's been processed a little bit, but it's 100% it's walnut oil. It's stuff you can get in the grocery store uh, next to the olive oil and stuff like that. And that's about all I'm going to do to the undersides and sides because it adds a light surface uh, protection and it has a deeper color thing. On the top or any kind of woodworking where there's going to be a lot of hand moving and stuff like that. I will then take a soft wax finish. I use this uh, Howard Citrus Shield just because I've used it for years. I, I like it. And I will buff that on with a car buffer. Uh, if you put a plastic bag over the car buffer, uh, let that sit overnight. You can reuse the same buffer without having to wash it and stuff like that because it doesn't let it dry out. I'll go over that in the evening. And then the next day I'll go back over it and then I'll let that fully dry. I will buff that and then I will go over it with a hard canuba wax. The same stuff you use on your car. And that gives me a good durable finish for working and stuff like that. That A, I can repair easily. If anything happens to this section, I can repair just this section in about 15, 20 minutes. And B, I am not in a clean environment. Sawdust is everywhere. Those people that put nice film finishes on stuff like that, any piece of sawdust that lands on it while it's drying will be a blemish. I can do this surface finish, continue working right next to it like I'm doing right now, and if sawdust gets on it, I just wipe it off. Because this is a finish that doesn't really sit on the surface other than that last carnauba wax. Uh, it kind of penetrates a little bit and everything else just wipes off. That's why I like it because in my environment, it works well. And here's something I want y'all to notice. On this side of the table, it's a little bit of a craftsman theme, my woodworking background. The other side is the metal side. Well, one of the tricks that people use in the craftsman kind of style is they will actually bevel the edges of their joints. So on this piece right here, you might have noticed I took a block plane and I put a slight bevel right there. What that does is it gives me a very clean and straight shadow line, a minute shadow line right there that makes it look like a really tight joint even though there's a slight gap there because the light is even all the way across. Now, this is not a perfect joint. There are some minor gaps in there, no big deal, because nobody will see it unless they get down and look at it right at the level of this table, 
which nobody's ever going to do. You always kind of see it at an angle. So if your eyesight is anywhere but flat, if it's like this, you can't see it. Anywhere like that, it's invisible. It's a little trick they used in the hand tool woodworking whenever they wanted to hide any kind of blemishes. You also notice I did that on all my finger joints. Got a little bevel on bottom and a little bevel on the side. That's going to help hide any gaps because these fingers are actually a little bit protruding. So all people will see is the perfect shadow line unless they either get it right on its edge or they get down on their knees and look underneath it, which nobody's really going to do. And you know, at five feet away, it will look like a perfect joint despite my inaccuracies. Next, I'm going to be attaching a leg uh, to butt up against this. Now, some of y'all might not notice in the last montage that I drilled a hole in each one of the fingers. I also use a square fort mortising bit to square up the hole. I'm going to be pegging them in order to turn it into a completely mechanical joint. We've already established that finger joints, that they prevent movement this way and this way because the fingers are in the way for both the top and bottom sideboards. The only thing it doesn't prevent is this movement and this movement. Well, if I drive a peg in this way, it prevents this one from moving. If I drive pegs in this way, it prevents that one from moving. So now there is no way there's any movement via the finger joint. Now, traditionally, you would use a wooden peg. I'm going to use screws for the simple reason it's also going to act as a clamp. Now we all know that screwing into end grain, there's very little strength there because the fibers are already, they're severed. So you can just pull a screw out if you get really aggressive. The screw's purpose is not this direction, it's this direction. And having a bunch of them in there will make it pretty strong. The square recess is just because I'm gonna cover it up because after they've x-rayed a lot of green and green style furniture, they did discover that a lot of those joints were screwed together and the pegs were just screwed head covers. Now I have run into one problem. You might notice that I haven't done this over one or two days. Like really that's all this should have taken. I've been doing it in the evening while I'm doing other work. So uh, that's kind of why you've seen so many different t-shirts. But over that time, this board has somewhat warped a tad bit. Can you see a little bit of that gap right there? So if I'm pegging it here, I don't want too much of a gap to be showing here. So I, I need to uh, take care of that. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna see me, I'm gonna screw this screw in, and that's gonna cinch the board down this way. And then I'm going to drill these holes and screw those in most of the way. That will secure it this way. Then I can remove this screw right here and then screw these in the rest of the way to close up that gap so much. And then I will go back and re-screw all these top ones. And that should utilize the screws as a decent clamp to close up my gaps a little bit. So here's that gap I was talking about. It's touching here and it's touching on the other side and you can see the bow has a gap coming out right there. Now I had thought that I would need to screw up underneath this one right here to remove a small gap in the middle there, but this, this board did not warp at all. So it's completely sitting completely flush. So right now I'm just gonna put a screw in on each one of those. So I've now taped off where this beam is going to be. I'm gonna go ahead and unscrew it, remove it, kind of clean off any finish that's on that one section so I can get the ultimate glue adhesion between long grain and long grain. And then we'll reassemble it and let it dry overnight. To clamp it up, we use rope.
And FYI, if you take those popsicle sticks, just take your knife and just kind of give yourself a nice little edge. Makes excellent glue scrapers. The last bit of woodworking I need to do is take these half inch sections I took off of these edges and turn them into a half inch by half inch dowel so I can plug all those screw holes and make it look nice. Now here's a somewhat easy way to pillow pegs. You know, I was I was sand the top smooth, but getting that nice little edge treatment that a lot of people do. Well, if you take a pad right here, and I've freshly sharpened my chisel, so I'm going to pad my edge, and then I'm just going to come up, and it kind of hits about halfway, and then just kind of scrape it up. Use your edge as a scraper, and you can get a nice little pillowing effect. Easy peasy. So now it's just a matter of uh, getting this into my office along with that tool chest and uh, hoping and praying I got my measurements right. And that's a wrap. Well, sort of. Y'all know me. I, I never finish anything 100%. I'm still waiting on a step bit so I can enlarge one of the holes on the back side because right now the power cords are just going over the end. And underneath this, if y'all can see it, I've got all my hard drives and stuff like that. It'll keep it nice and dust free. I don't turn them on very often. My basic setup is I have a very cheap Intel Nook uh, taped to the back of my monitor which I do all my work on, and then I transition all files to an archive place. I have a really expensive RAID set up for all my important stuff that it would just devastate my business if I lost it. But then I also have a lot of other hard drives in there that I use to archive all my footage and stuff in case I need to go back and pull clips on at a later date. It's a Casey Neistat trick. Those hard drives are not turned on very often, so I expect them to last a good long time. And other than that, all my wiring and stuff is inside there to keep the wiring nice and neat over here. I love having drawers finally, and I got a few of those accessories I talked about that you can get from uh, the big box store, discount store, to dress this up. Uh, just makes things a little bit more useful. But that's it. It's almost like I'm a real adult now with a real work desk. Who knew that it could happen at mid-50s? <laughs> well, I hope you all picked up a few tips and tricks along the way. I know this was a very long video, but I did try to intersperse it with tidbits all over the place. But in the end, I want you to remember that it's always worth the effort to learn new things, make new stuff, and share it with others. Be safe and have fun.